and welcome in for episode number five of NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network. Coming to you from the Concord, North Carolina studios, my name is Chris Wilner, talking all things grassroots racing in short track action, and also my co-host joining me from Killingly, Connecticut, Kyle Ricky. Kyle, I busted out the polo shirt, sun is out, 70 degrees here in North Carolina. Boy, it was nice to have the dog outside and soak in some rays. What about you? How are things up there in Connecticut? Oh, things are great up here. Uh, let's see. Last Friday, we had a snowstorm, and then it froze over to ice uh, after we got six inches of snow. Uh, no, thank it's you. It's continuing to melt. We have a high of 40, 45 degrees today, so it's a warm one here as, as uh, you know, we get started here in the week. Yeah, and you guys are getting awfully excited, too, up there with Stafford Motor Speedway. What, six weeks now out from the Spring Sizzler? That probably can't come soon enough for you. 50th running of the Napa Spring Sizzler at Stafford Speedway. Uh, new format this year, dual qualifying races the day before. Uh, I think there's almost 40 cars entered already, and we're expecting about 50. So can't wait. Uh, the new big board's up. We're testing that most days, making sure that's good to go. So uh, it's going to be a great 2022 season kicking off here in, in six weeks' time. Certainly looking forward to it. And I tell you what, this weekend felt pretty quiet in general. I for the Very. first time in a while, got to enjoy some of the NASCAR racing action, some of the stuff on flow this weekend as well. Uh, what did you pay attention to? What What did you do this weekend? Did you got uh, get a little time off? Uh, yeah, uh, recovered from Daytona <laughs> and and everything that happened down there. But uh, yeah, by the weekend rolled around, I you know was glued to to the television, glued to the Motor Racing Network, and uh, tuned in to the NASCAR Xfinity Series race on Saturday, which I think is done by now. I have Felt like that race took, what, three hours and 31 minutes. Something uh, like one that. Of the longest, one of the longest Xfinity races I've I've ever seen, but uh, it kept your attention, I think, for most of that three hours and 31-minute mark. Uh, and then the NASCAR Cup race, watched some Supercross on, on Saturday night, so NHRA drag racing. So even though most of the short tracks were off, a lot of the national uh, groups were, were in action, and a uh, lot happening. Uh, you know, things are beginning to pick up. It's that time of the year where every week we're going to talk more and more about you know short tracks across the country and sanctioning bodies across the country uh running their season openers and and that's you know my favorite time of this my favorite time of year yeah and if you can't tell folks at home kyle eats sleeps breathes drinks everything racing and that's why i love him and that's why he's on the show right kyle <laughs> that's right that's right it uh, it never stops it that's... never stops even even in when we have six feet of snow on the ground in december i have you on down in Tulsa, Oklahoma, listening yep. to you do the Tulsa shootout. So, ah, uh, what a good time. Good times. Yeah, what good times for sure. What a good time that was. We do have some news, though, to talk about here this week as we kind of, like Kyle mentioned, you know, a lot of tracks are gearing up for their season openers. The snow, in some cases, is thawing, and we're about to uh, unleash race cars around the world and around the country here for short track racing. I do want to mention, though, it's pretty cool. The Slinger Nationals, which Kyle, you know, is is a premier event each and every year. 20000 to win this year, so they bumped it up 10K, and uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty awesome because last year we saw Luke Fenhouse become the youngest winner of the Slinger Nationals. Can you imagine winning 20K at that young age? Nope, not at all. <laughs> not at uh, all. But, but good for Luke, and it, it yeah. also allowed him to to race in, in another event there at the track a couple of weeks later in SRX. Yeah, definitely. And and, and speaking of XRX, because we also want to mention that Derek Thorne's already signed up for the, uh, for the Slinger Nationals, so pretty early for that event coming up later in the summer. But speaking of SRX, the Blizzard Series doubleheader at uh, Five Flags Speedway, Pensacola in April, will now become a race to see who's going to compete in the SRX season opener, which will be held down there in June. The average finish, uh, the best average finish by a driver on both nights of racing will get the ticket to run with the SRX series in June. So I, I feel like this is a really good marketing tool, Kyle, for SRX and really for short track racing. Some of these marquee events upping the ante, saying if you want to race with the national boys you know, on the SRX Tour, come out and perform at, at one of our races. No doubt it's the new trend. Uh, we, when we saw it start last year uh, with the Slinger Nationals, uh, Five Flags is picking up on it. Stafford's picking up on it. The winner of the, the, the uh, Spring Sizzler will get that right. uh, 12th spot in the SRX lineup, uh, or maybe 13. I don't know. SRX keeps teasing <laughs> that they might have 13 at some races. So who knows? Uh, a lot of questions are around that series as drivers continue to be announced. But um, it, it's uh, no doubt a, a great promotion opportunity for for the short tracks that host those events. And, and I'm glad to see Five Flags 
is taking advantage of it. Yeah, those Pepper Jack Kennels twin twin 100 lappers will be April 8th and 9th. So again, coming up here in just about a month or so. And speaking of SRX, we'll tie a bow on it. They're announcing their confirmed list of drivers already. And we have some of the similar names that we've seen before, right? Michael Waltrip, Paul Tracy, Elio Castroneves, Tony Kanan, Marco Andrani, Bobby Labonte. But how about the Biff coming back full-time? Greg Biffle, Ryan hunter Ray going to be a new addition from IndyCar, oh. and Joseph Newgarden's going to run his hometown race at the Nashville Fairgrounds. So again, Kyle, we get this nice mix of NASCAR, IndyCar, and then obviously we'll have our short track aces uh, get involved as well. And I think you forgot Ryan Newman. And, yeah. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. Think, and and uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, I don't think we're done yet. SRX, no. you know, continuing to tease announcements. And I hear there are some current drivers that are in the running for some of those open rides that are trying to to break away from the national series if they can. And if their schedule allows, I believe there is uh, one weekend in July where uh, the trucks aren't running, and there's at least uh, one or two drivers looking to compete in that open weekend at the SRX event up at Stafford. So we'll see. Uh, it's an exciting time uh, for short tracks and, and for the National Series. And uh, I, I, I'm excited about the lineup this year. Great to see Ryan Hunter Ray added to that lineup. Such a, a great personality in IndyCar. I'm glad Elio Castroneves is back. Um, I was at that Stafford event doing all the trackside stuff a year ago, and I mean, Castro Nevis brought the place to their feet. Oh, yeah. Uh, you wanted, if you wanted to get the, the, the crowd pumped up, and there were about 10,000 there, uh, he was the guy to do it, and he did. So, um, yeah, look forward to the start of that season here coming up in a couple of months, and that means hopefully the snow will be gone. Yeah. Well, we hope, but uh, for sure, it definitely yeah. will. As they open at uh, Pensacola's Five Flags Speedway in June 18th in South Boston, we have Stafford on July 2nd, Nashville Fairgrounds Speedway as well, which is one of the most popular ones, I think, from last year. In addition to Stafford, we'll be back as well on July the 9th. I-55 Raceway in Peavey, Missouri, host of the Ironman World of Outlaws race on dirt. Well, it's going to have SRX on it as well on July 16th, and it all wraps up at Sharon Speedway out in Ohio on the 23rd of July couple other news and notes. Ryan Priest, Kyle, we a guy we've talked about many times here on Coast to Coast on the short track level, now working his way into the NASCAR National National Series. Well, he's going to be back in a truck, going to try to go two for two. His truck uh, single started at Nashville last year. He won. He's going to try to do it in Vegas. Going to race at Las Vegas Motor Speedway this Friday night here on the Motor Racing Network, driving for David Gilliland Racing, partnered with United Rentals uh, for select events this year, all uh both of those teams or, or both of those entities tied into Stuart Haas racing. So uh, going to be interesting to see how Ryan does on Friday night. Kyle Busch is in the field. So that's, you know, going to be hurdle number one. Uh, <laughs> but going to be a great race. Can't wait to get out to uh, Sin City here in a couple of days' time and cover that event for the network on Friday. Yep, Kyle and I will both be there for the Motor Racing Network. And uh, finally, want to touch on, too, for those of you that follow the Arc Menard Series as well as the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, good news, if you miss a race live on Flow, you can catch them all tape delayed, and they will air on the USA Networks this year, all events in 2022 for both series. So, Kyle, again, some national TV exposure, maybe tape delayed, but that's all right. If you miss the race, it's on the USA Network. Pretty cool. Anytime you can get on a, uh, in a on a network, you know, obviously you want the big networks, right? The the the, the Foxes, sure. the main Foxes and the main NBCs. But if you can get on uh, one of the, the uh, subsidiary, sub subsidiary networks, uh, like a USA network, and like what we've seen in years past with S NBCSN and FS1, uh, any airtime is good airtime, and it's going to be good to see uh, all of those events, for the most part, on USA Network this year. And really great exposure for some of the up-and-coming drivers like Tony Bridinger, who we are going to have on here after the break. The driver of the Venturini Motorsports, number 25, Toyota Camry. A stellar opening run in Daytona. She's been blazing trails throughout her career as a driver up-and-coming in NASCAR series. We're going to talk to her coming up next on NASCAR Coast to Coast. And joining us now on NASCAR Coast to Coast is the driver, the number 25 in Treaty Motorsports Toyota Camry, Tony Bridinger. Welcome into the show. We appreciate you uh, joining us. It's been pretty hectic getting the start of the year in Daytona. Now you had some time to think about it. Uh, what was your overall assessment? Running up front there at the very end, a top 10 finish. That's got to be a pretty good way for you to start the year. 
Yeah, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm happy with how Daytona went. Um, you know, my team, like obviously they have really fast cars and Venturini is just great at driver development. So going into it, I had high hopes just knowing that I had such a great team and such great coaching behind me. Um, so I definitely think I had high hopes and I think we pretty much achieved what we wanted to achieve. I would have loved that top five. We were pretty close to it at the end, um, got into it a little bit on the last lap, but I mean, we still finished the race. Um, the car had a few scratches, but didn't get too torn up or anything like that. So, um, I think it was a pretty solid run for sure. 18th in that same race a year ago and now a, a full year of experience later how much more comfortable were you just driving into daytona international speedway and then ultimately behind the wheel during the race yeah i mean i definitely felt more comfortable about racing at daytona just because i kind of knew what to expect but i think i almost felt just as nervous just because i knew my car was really fast and just driving for venture any motorsports i think there was a little bit more pressure on that just because you are in such great equipment and um just overall i mean i think you know the standards are a little bit higher so um i think i still had those same nerves going into it but um but yeah definitely you know an improvement from last year last year I made so many mistakes and i feel like i cleaned that up a little bit this year you mentioned Venturini Motorsports, a team that's a powerhouse. When we talk Arkham Menard Series racing, I mean, 76 wins over the course of their, their tenure. Do you feel any added pressure being a part of that winning team and being maybe a little bit more pressure to win sometime this season? Yeah, I feel like I definitely put pressure on myself. And they always tell me, like, why are you so hard on yourself? Why are you putting so much pressure on yourself? <laughs> you know, just focus on the development and, like, getting there. Like, don't just you know, tell yourself, oh, I'm going to go win this week and like work on those top tens and then those top fives. Um, so I feel like they do a really great job in not making me feel like, oh my God, you have to go out there and win right now. They understand that they need to develop me and they're willing to do that. Um, but I think I put the most pressure on myself, but they've been really great, really supportive. You raced for Venturini, a handful of races in 2018, uh, rejoined with the team for, I believe, four events at the end of last season. How good does it feel to come into 2022 knowing you're, you're, your comfort level with this team and that you're going to run a full season. Yeah, I definitely think, you know, the fact that I'm running a full season gives me a little bit more comfort just in the sense that I know, okay, one shot to like go out there, prove myself. You have that consistency and you're able to really build a relationship with your team, your crew chief, your spotter. You're not just, you know, racing one weekend and then a month later doing another race. So I really feel like I have something that I can build off of this year and um, I'm excited. You mentioned kind of getting comfortable. I know being a part of the Toyota driver development camp is huge. And, you know, we talked to uh, Drew Dollar about that as, as he's another driver, part of that camp. But also getting to run some of the short track stuff again with the World Series of Asphalt. I know you took part of that at New Smyrna. What are some of the things that you work on when you go take part in, in some of those series and just to kind of get behind the seat and get some more laps? What are some things that you focus on to, to further your driver development? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing when I go late mall racing is just to log those laps in. I think, you know, no matter what you're driving or what you're racing, seat time is seat time. Um, so for me, it's just about, you know, working on that race craft, working on those restarts, passing, um, just little things like that. I think it doesn't really matter what you're racing. Everything kind of helps. And um, even go-karting, I was go-karting today. And I think that just kind of helps, you know, um, keep you in shape and keep your mind sharp and your hand-eye coordination where it needs to be. You mentioned go-karting. I believe that's your original ride in in, yeah. <laughs> your, in in motorsports. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, how does a young lady from Hillsboro, California, get involved in motorsports? What sparked that interest? Yeah, so my dad was just driving down the highway one day, and he saw this billboard um, for Sonoma Raceway for go-kart classes. And he was like, oh, I, this would be fun to take my daughters to. Um, we had winter break, so we didn't really have much going on. And um, me and my sisters loved it. I thought we thought it was so fun. And I was at the age where I was trying so many different sports and hobbies and nothing was really clicking. And my parents saw the spark when I got into a go-kart and they're like, wait, I think this is it for her. Um, but it was funny cause they never pushed me into it. I was always the one that was begging them. Like, let's get a go-kart. Like I'm going to go go-karting and same with my sister. Um, so my parents never really pushed us into it. And I definitely don't think my dad's vision for me was to be a race car driver. <laughs> uh, I definitely kind of, um, pursued that myself. And then you all of a sudden just explode onto the scene, USAC, 19 career victories. How the heck do you go from open wheel racing like that with the USAC and then come in and go short track racing, pavement racing, and ultimate leading uh, to the Arkham Menard series? I mean, what is the transition like going from an open wheel car like that to a stock car? The transition's definitely big. I mean, 
the cars, like there's not really much you can compare between the two of them. I mean, with the open wheel car, you're sitting like right in the center of the car. And that was the biggest thing for me is like, I'm sitting on the left side now and, you know, just figuring out your spacing, the car is much bigger than like a little midget car. Um, so it was definitely a very big transition for me, but as soon as I did, um, I think it was like even my first midget race, I saw late models and I was like, dad, why are we not doing this? But my dad's always been an open wheel guy. And he was like, no, like, you know, the open wheel is cool. And I was like, but those look so much fun. And he told me if I got a championship in the midgets that he'd let me go late model racing. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and there you went uh, off of the late models. <laughs> Last year, we, and we talk on this show every week about the diverse schedule of ARCA, super speedway, short tracks, uh, intermediate tracks, dirt tracks. I, I believe you competed in all of those types of race tracks a year ago. Uh, where's your comfort zone? Do, do you like? and prefer one of those style racetracks over another? I feel like my comfort zone is still with short tracks just because I'm most familiar with them. But last year, I think I chose probably like the hardest races to do with Venturini. I chose the two dirt races, which I have like no dirt racing experience. And I chose Winchester, which is a really hard short track. Um, so I definitely chose races that were out of my comfort zone. But I'm looking forward to just going to so many different new tracks this year. And I think the variety is fun and exciting. And I like pushing myself and knowing that, okay, I'm not really familiar with this and going out of my comfort zone and just learning to adapt really fast. You're also a part of this surge of females in our sport rising the ranks. And uh, certainly not the first, but you are the first Arab American female to be in NASCAR. So how have you embraced that, especially now being on the national level? And, and, and what's it been like for you to rise the ranks and now getting support from Bush Light and part of their uh, Accelerate initiative? Yeah, I mean, it's been really amazing. I feel like after last year, we just started to receive a lot of support, which has been really exciting. And we've been able to work with so many brands that support female athletes like Hair Club, Free People Movement, and so many other brands, Huda Beauty. So I feel like it's just very inspiring to have these brands come on board and support us female athletes and really believe in us. And it's um, it's been really great so far. Was it cool to see your commercial? <laughs> oh, yeah, that commercial was super cool, yeah. That was really fun shooting, and it was fun to shoot it with all the other girls. I mean, I've never um, – I didn't talk to some of those girls before. I didn't really get a chance to meet them. So it's kind of nice for us to all kind of come together for that commercial for sure. How big is that, though, just because you talk about how much this sport is sponsorship-driven, sponsorship right? That's what powers keeping you guys and gals in the seat, you know, each and every week. So – the support like that, what does it mean to you personally? Uh, because I think it's just going to be a chain reaction. It's going to, you're going to start to see more and more support to get you guys, you know, where you want to be. Yeah. You know, motorsports is definitely a pay to play sport. You can't go racing if you don't have the funding for it. So getting that sponsorship um, and that support is definitely, you know, crucial for a lot of us to go racing. I mean, there's only two of us females running a full season in ARCA this year. Um, I know the other girls would definitely love to do it, but just that lack of funding. So it's just really important that we receive that support. And hopefully this does create a snowball effect and, you know, inspire other brands to get on board and support us as well. Para, you were part of a program earlier this week as we were recording this interview just about an hour ago, helping launch the new Gran Turismo game. Are you a yeah. gamer? <laughs> um, I'm honestly not. So that was my first time ever driving um, the Gan Gran Turismo game, just like in that little shoot that we did. And it was really fun. I had a lot of fun with it. And um, but yeah, I've heard of it before, but I was never really into the gaming. Have you, do you use tools like, you know, obviously with Toyota Racing Development has simulators, but like, have you, have you found that to be something that maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago, we weren't really talking about simulators and things like that, but how has that helped you, you know, of course, the last couple of years in your career? Oh, it's been so helpful. I think, you know, the simulators are so exact where if there's like a bump on the track, you see that bump or even at Phoenix, like they'll have like the cones on the fence. And I've been using that as like reference point. So there's like little things like that. And I just think it's very helpful, especially for somebody who hasn't gone to some tracks before just to get that seat time and laps around the track. So it's familiar and you're not just feeling like you're in over your head once you get there. I feel like I'm seeing you more and more uh, since we last talked a year ago in, in Daytona. Um, we talked about the Bush Light deal, Gran Turismo. I feel like you're on a lot of red carpets. You were on Ellen last year. What has this last 365 days or so been like for you and just, uh, you know, your growth into the sport? Yeah, it's been a roller coaster. I mean, 
a little over a year ago, I had absolutely nothing going on. And then we got to Daytona and I still didn't really have most of my season figured out. And um, we kind of just, you know, skyrocketed after that. And it's been really exciting and it's been a journey. And um, it's cool to finally be able to run a full season because even though I was on all this amazing stuff last year, I still was only able to run like nine races. Um, so it's exciting to finally get kind of all the pieces coming together now. So with all that momentum and all that kind of riding into this season, what is 2020 like what defines a good season for you this year being full-time with Venturini I mean what expectations are you setting for yourself what is the team setting for yourself yeah you know I talked with Billy about it just my goals you know going into the season and broken down by each race and um, I think it's just like important to be realistic like if I'm going to a track that I haven't been to before I'm not going to be like oh I'm going to go win like set actual realistic goals that we can go shoot for and if we win that's great um, but I think it's important just to shoot for those, you know, realistic goals. Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, definitely going for rookie of the year this year and um, for the championship, we're running a full season. And I think there's a few other drivers doing that. So, um, I mean, I know I have the car to do it. So we'll see what happens. Heading to the Phoenix Raceway next out there in Arizona. A little bit of redemption for you uh, this year after I don't think you completed a lap last year. <laughs> you were involved in that incident off turn two for the on, on lap one. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully it goes better than last year. I haven't had the most look at that track, but I'm excited. I also ran in what is it, the spring there. So wait, no, it was the fall, the fall, sorry, the spring and the fall. Um, so I feel like I have experience at this track more than any of the other tracks this year. So I'm excited to kind of go somewhere where I feel like, okay, like I know this track, haven't had the best luck, but I feel confident about like, you know, the line and just like driving on it. Do you have a track that you've circled this year that you said, you know, I think this is going to be my favorite one of this year. I know you've kind of already done a good smattering of them. But is there one that sticks out for you on the schedule this year? I would say I'm really looking forward to Talladega. Um, I think, you know, we had speed at Daytona and feel like the little mistakes I made at Daytona, I can, um, you know, correct that and improve on that at Talladega. So I think we have a good shot there. So I'm really looking forward to that one. My final question for you is about the draft and we'll stick with the Talladega theme since that's the next super speedway race coming up on the schedule here in a couple of months time. What'd you learn? Uh, you've been in the, the Daytona race now the last couple of years. You were up in the lead draft the entire uh, 80 lap distance last week. Uh, what was the big takeaway from that experience? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, I was so surprised, you know, how much the car handles differently when you're drafting versus when you're not drafting and just you can feel when people are around you, like it's moving your car around, the wind's moving you. Um, so just like realizing how to like adapt to that. I mean, the first session during practice at Daytona, I like was kind of like all over the place. Honestly, it was my first time really drafting, you know, in a group and I was behind before I was just like leading the pack. And I was like, I didn't really know where to look. I felt like I was looking like right in front of me and they're like, get your eyes up, like be super smooth. And that made all the difference. Just, you know, kind of relaxing and not being so tense. Cause when you have like a bunch of cars in front of you, you're just kind of feel like a little more on edge when you're out there up front. It's a little more relaxing. Uh, so I think the biggest thing for me was just being smooth and staying calm. Well, Tony, we really appreciate your time. So happy to see you and all your success, even just in the last 365 days, you know, since we talked about part-time schedule, now going full-time racing. Uh, best of luck the rest of the season, and I uh, can't wait to see what you do in Phoenix. Awesome. Thank you for having me, guys. That was Tony Brininger, and we'll be right back here on NASCAR Coast to Coast. And a very special thank you to Tony Bridinger for joining us on NASCAR Coast to Coast. Kyle, to kind of put a bow on it, boy, she's a young lady you've seen kind of grow through this sport over the last couple of years. And how cool is it to see this new wave, this new surge of talent, not necessarily because she's a female, but just this whole young talent group that's coming up through the Arkham Menard series now. And I think it's going to be a force to be reckoned with here over the next couple of years, moving uh, all the way up to the NASCAR National Series. Yeah, uh, no doubt. And you can add her teammate, Corey Heim, to that list as well. Yep. Uh, two drivers that have done so well here in the last couple of years. But it's been fun to follow Tony the last year. Uh, she was very green, very new to, to this style of racing a year ago in Daytona when I was able to sit down with her and, and, and talk about, at that time, you know, all she really knew is the USAC stuff on dirt. She did well. You mentioned earlier during the interview, 19 wins, and she, she knew karting. Um, big track stuff. Fairly new. She had a couple of short track uh, races under her belt. But, man, 
how far she has come in the last year, uh, both in, in on the racetrack and off the racetrack with everything that she has done to market herself. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Tony Bridinger and in, in no doubt for, for years to come. Absolutely. And she's a uh, free people movement ambassador too, is on the cover of time magazine back around Thanksgiving of 2021. Yep. So super, super cool. All right. Well, the snow is thawing, as we mentioned at the top of the show. We've got some season openers to talk about. Kyle, there's a good list of racetracks getting ready to kick off 2022. One of them is going to be the Smart Modified Tour kicking off their 2022 season. And if it's anything like last year, it's going to be a pretty, pretty good uh, championship season. What do you think? Pesomatic, the new title sponsor, going to be a great season. Came down to the final lap of the final race a year ago. They're going to open up this weekend at Florence Speedway in South Carolina, the Low Country 99. Uh, you can tune in live to Flow Racing to watch all the action, 2.45 Eastern time. I believe even Bobby Labonte will be back in the series uh, running as much as he can this year, along with all the Southern Modified regulars that uh, were used to winning and running and winning those races. Most of them also compete full-time over at Bowman Gray Stadium when they open up shop here in a couple of months' time as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Bobby's so much fun to watch in that series, and he takes it yes, super seriously, too. You know what I mean? If you watch some of his post race interviews, like you'd think he's racing in a cup series again, isn't he? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, and that's, you know, the racer in him, and that's the generation that he grew up in, in in the 80s and the 90s. I mean, every time he was in a race car, I mean, he was he was the driver when I first got into the sport um, and, and, worked as an intern at new hampshire motor speedway in the in, i think it was the mid or late 90s i mean bobby was more intimidating to me than like dale earnhardt uh was uh wow. just very quiet when he didn't want to talk and usually he didn't uh it was one word answers and i remember he told me he was the first one to ever tell me if i told you i have to kill you and it, and it was a simple <laughs> question i was just trying to get notes for the media right, center but right. that was the focus that was just the focus Bobby had back then, and he carries that in into the to the modified, you know, 25 years later. So the Smart Modified Tour, catch it once again Saturday at Florence. A couple racetracks opening their regular season schedule of racing in 2022. The Goodyear All-American Speedway in Jacksonville, North Carolina, that just hosted their Winter Heat Series. They kick off on Saturday. You can see that on Speed51.tv. And also Hickory Motor Speedway, home of some of NASCAR's stars that got their roots here in North Carolina. They are kicking off their season Saturday as well with the NASCAR Advanced Auto Parts Weekly Series featuring late model stocks and limited late models as well as some mini stocks, renegades, and streak stocks. So it's always good to see, Kyle, when we talk about local tracks opening their season. It's a big deal, and especially uh, when you talk about all the craziness we've had in the world in the last couple of years, just to have a somewhat normal schedule this year has got to feel pretty good. Yeah, two years ago at this time, we were wondering if we were going to race, and then it was... Okay, we can race, but nobody can go to watch. Right, so everyone's right. Everyone's trying to throw together streaming services. Now we're back at 100% capacity, and we have a great platform like Flow Racing, where Hickory Motor Speedway is going to make its debut for the weekly program. So um, if anything good came out of the last two years, it's that now there's a very extensive platform where we can watch a lot of these short track races across the country. We've done it with uh, the dirt stuff for the last several years. The last year, uh, Flo dove into asphalt for the first time with Stafford, Oswego, and Thunder Road. And now um, the full complement of the NASCAR Advanced Auto Parts Weekly Series racetracks, um, Modified Tour, all the ARCA East and West, and, and Hickory Motor Speedway, part of that program as well. It's going to be fun to watch the Twin 40s on Saturday night. Absolutely. Once again, on Flow Racing. And then uh, we're leading up to the Rattler weekend in Alabama, but it all kicks off the 58th annual Alabama 200 Montgomery Motor Speedway, kicking things off on Saturday. The hunt for the bear, Kyle. It's uh, it's an intense race to kick, uh, kick start the year. Chase Elliott, a former winner of that as well. Just how big is that event? Big event. Uh, 30 cars, uh, over 30 cars entered right now. $10,000 to win. Um, some, Like you mentioned, some big names have won that event. Uh, and very healthy entry list. Justin Bonnet, Joel, uh, Jolyn Wilkinson, uh, Caden Honeycutt, Brittany Zamora, Hunter Robbins, all big names down in Southern Pro Late Model Racing, going to be involved in, in the event this uh, this weekend. Down at Montgomery, going to be fun to watch. 
40 lap outlaw features also included on the docket as well as a 50 lap modified a mayhem tour series race so if you didn't get enough of that you've got even two more races to uh to indulge yourself here down in alabama also speaking of pro late models the carolina pro late model season opener is coming up on saturday on racing america at southern national one of the storied racetracks in short track racing a Carolina Pro Relate Model Series has grown exponentially. I can't imagine 2022 is going to be any different. I believe this is its third season, if memory serves me right. Yeah. Um, 19 cars on the entry list. They expect that to grow by a few by the time race day rolls around this weekend. Caden uh, Quapple among those that uh, are highlighted on the entry list, along with Kyle Campbell, Katie Hedinger, Amber Lynn, uh, just uh, four of those 19 drivers looking to compete this weekend. Southern National Motorsports Park, the home track of our very own Alex Hayden. That's right. And again, with all these tracks opening their 2022 seasons, and we like to focus uh, sometimes a lot on the national tour and what guys and girls are doing, but these track championships mean a lot for some of these drivers, and it all starts this weekend for a handful of them, and it really could launch somebody's career being a track champion, right, Kyle? A track champion, and then you... You know, if, if it's a NASCAR affiliated racetrack, you're you're a state champion, a regional champion, and and you know, like Josh Berry, a, a national champion. And we saw what a national championship can do to propel Josh onto the national map. And now he's running full time in the NASCAR Xfinity, Xfinity Series for Junior Motorsports. Uh, picked up several wins last year, uh, running part time for the team. So um, you're right; it all starts at your home track. And and for a lot of these drivers, you know, their goal is to make it into NASCAR's national spotlight. And, uh, you know, it all starts this weekend for a lot of those drivers trying to get there. The road begins this weekend when those gates open for the first time at several of these facilities. Well, and they're not where Kyle is because they're still dealing with threats of snow, but no. we're getting there, Kyle. We're, get, we're, we're, get, we're getting there. Uh, but go support your local tracks this weekend if there are opening. It's certainly going to be a lot, and you can also check out all the action on Flow Racing and all the streaming services as well as uh, we're kind of getting into it now. March is here, and it's time to go short track racing. So, Kyle, I look forward to seeing you in Vegas, although you just told me the weather looking pretty cold. So that's going to be different for us. Yeah. Don't bring your bathing suit because oh, man. I don't think the pool is going to be open at the hotel. Uh, I think I saw a high of like 64 degrees on on Friday. But yet when we're flying there uh, Thursday, 80, I think it's like 82 degrees or something. It's like a 20 degree drop overnight. So oh, my goodness. Our, our luck. Well, safe travels. I can't wait to see you there. And again, you can catch all the action in the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series event Friday night. Victoria's Speak 200 at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Well, Kyle, we'll see you then. Thanks for joining us, everyone. For Kyle Ricky, I'm Chris Wilner. Thanks for tuning in to the Motor Racing Network's NASCAR Coast to Coast. We'll see you next time.